I wanna start with a, a question that seems fairly straightforward and simple. How goes your soul? How goes your soul? It's, it's a question that Methodists have been asking one another for over 250 years. How goes your soul? It's a, it's a question that John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement and other early Methodists asked each other before and after worship in their small groups, in their bands and in their classes, when they met together, when they did a check-in, right? It's an opportunity to encourage others, to support others, to challenge each other and to, to hold each other accountable. How goes your soul? Seems simple enough, right? It's a straightforward question. And yet it is loaded. It's a, it's a loaded question because honestly answering this question opens us up to all sorts of thoughts and feelings. Memories and ideas that each and every one of us have, unique and rightfully so. Honestly, answering this question, how goes your soul, forces us to consider not only our spiritual health, but also our mental and emotional health as well. Can our faith and our mental and emotional health align? What might this look like? I'm Pastor Jess Horsley. I'm one of the associates here. I am grateful that you are worshiping here at Platwoods Church, whether you're in person or online. This is an opportunity for us this month to be asking these challenging questions during our faith and sermon series. When we consider these ideas that many believe conflict with our faith, as we're often asked to answer these either or type questions, right? Like we have to make a decision between this or that. Last week, Pastor Evie kicked off our series with faith and science, right? We explored how our faith and science do not have to conflict. They do engage in dialogue. They integrate even, right? To help us better know our God and understand God's marvelous creation. Anybody observe the eclipse? Beautiful, right? Amazing. So today we continue this sermon series, Faith and Mental and Emotional Health. Now, I wanna just take a moment, a quick moment to say that your mental and emotional health matter, all right? They are vital to your, to each and every one of our overall well-being. And so this morning we are going to explore various aspects of our faith and our mental and emotional health. And I never, ever want to intentionally cause anyone pain or hurt. So please, please take care of yourself this morning. And while we are glad you are here, if you need, we understand if you need to step away. So I want to start with a definition. The World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes their abilities and can cope with the normal stresses of life, work productively, and contribute to their community. Now, I like this definition a lot, all right? It takes into consider, in consideration both our own individual being as well as our community, each other, right? It acknowledges our connection with each other, with other people. It, it also affirms that it's not only who we are that matters, right? Each and every one of us matter no matter what, but what we do also matters. Our abilities matter. Our abilities and how we are called to realize our full potential. And likewise, this definition takes into account our coping with the normal stresses of life, those experiences that are typical for each and every one of us individually, and those can vary, we know that. Right? Each and every one of us have different typicals in our lives. It also takes into account our ability to contribute to society, to our community at large, to each other. It acknowledges that each and every one of you have something to contribute to the whole. All of us have something to share. And that is a beautiful thing. 
Now, it should be no surprise that America is facing a mental and emotional health crisis, and none of us are immune. Over the past three years, mental health care providers across America have seen a 40% increase in people seeking care. This is good news. It's encouraging news. It also means there is a significant shortage in resources. Even with all of the resources that our country has available, even with everything that we hear and we see about discussing mental and emotional health care, we talk about it constantly, right? In our homes, as some of you shared in our in our survey. We talk about it at school. We talk about it in our workplaces, in the news and in the media and music and movies. There still today exists a stigma around seeking and receiving mental and emotional care. More than half of those who have a mental or emotional condition or issue go untreated every single day in America. More than half. And for far too long, for far too many people, the church... The church has been and continues to be a place where that stigma exists. For too many people, too many churches, too many faith communities, they have been complicit in or even contributed to individual and community mental and emotional harm. It is unhealthy for us to avoid difficult topics and conversations. Right? Hear that again. It is unhealthy for us to avoid difficult topics and conversations. And when we do it in the name of God or our faith, that is spiritual manipulation. So here at Platwoods Church, we have made a commitment to having courageous conversations, to discussing, to exploring difficult topics. That's why we are exploring these different topics during this sermon series this month. It is important that we consider our faith and our mental and emotional well-being. It's not always been that way. It's not always been that way. And it still isn't for many people in many churches. Let me, let me ask you a rhetorical question, all right? Do not raise your hands, all right? Have you ever shared with somebody, right, even somebody of faith, that you're having uh, anxiety? You're worried, you're concerned about something, or maybe you're even down and depressed. Maybe you're just, you're simply not feeling it, Right? And this person simply says, well, you should pray about that. Or maybe they say something like, I'll pray for you, right? Or if you were only stronger, right? If your faith was just a little stronger. Or, and this is my favorite one, I'll pray for you. With God, all things are possible. Now, it's a rhetorical question, right? Again, but have you ever heard a version of this, right? Because I have. All right, and I want to just be clear, let me be crystal clear that prayer and faith are a vital part of my life. All right? As Christ followers, our lives are shaped by prayer and by faith. They are irreplaceable parts of our very being as Christ followers. There is power in prayer. There is power that transforms us, that draws us closer to the God that we know, the God who loves us. And I I truly believe that Through God, all things are possible. And I also realize that for so many people, comments like those I've shared are simply not helpful. Right? When we respond to someone sharing their feelings and their fears or their hurts and their traumas, their worries and their concerns, their anxieties, our response, as well-intended and as well-meaning as they might be, have often been a symptom of how our faith has been for far too long treating or perhaps mistreating mental and emotional health. So I want to think about this and rewind a little bit. Thousands of years ago, mental and emotional disorders were attributed to both natural and supernatural causes. All right. Many, many cultures had supernatural views of of these. So when a person acted out against their culture or their religion, it was often attributed to such, to to the supernatural. Hear, Hear these words from the First Testament book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 28, 
If you fully obey the Lord your God, the Lord will set you high above all the nations. All these blessings will come on you. You'll be blessed in the city and the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. Your barn and your work and all that you put your hand to will be blessed. However, however, if you do not obey the Lord your God, all of these curses will come on you and they will overtake you. The Lord will afflict you with boils and with tumors and with festering sores with no cure. The Lord will afflict you with madness, blindness, confusion of the mind. You will be unsuccessful in everything you do. Day after day, oppressed and robbed with no one to rescue you. Pardon my language, but damn. (laughs) Right? I just want... Okay, so like all the blessing part, I like that, right? Works, right? But these, this curse part, that last part, doesn't sound good at all. And thousands of years ago, this was the Hebrew people's belief, right? And if we are honest, we, and we have to be honest, if we're honest, there are still some people today who believe that God causes bad things to happen to us that God causes us to have physical and mental and emotional illnesses and stress and trauma and hurt and pain. And when you read scripture like this, it says because they disobeyed God. And yet, Jesus, Jesus in the gospel shows us something different. Throughout the gospels, when Jesus heals people, Jesus invites people back into connection, into community, into relationship. Not just with God, but with each other, with other people. Thousands of years ago, mental and emotional illnesses and disorders and abnormal behaviors were often attributed to disobedience to one's God or deity or the work of evil spirits or demons that have taken control of our bodies and minds. Early Hebrews and Greeks, Egyptians and Chinese cultures, they each had religious rituals. Maybe you've seen a movie exorcisms, right? To drive these evil spirits or demons out, even even the earliest surgical procedures some 8,000 years ago, it was meant to help the evil spirits or demons escape a person's body. And as as odd as that might sound, similar, similar surgical procedures called lobotomies were practiced right here in America until the late 1960s. So we have to ask, what are we supposed to do with this, right? As Christ followers today, what are we to do with this in our lives? Even even in modern day America, we still do not treat our mental or our emotional health like we do our physical health, right? We know, we know that it is impossible to ignore a heart attack or a dislocated kneecap or a broken bone or cut skin, physical wounds that present visibly, painfully for all of us to see. And yet today, all too often, mental and emotional wounds go unseen or ignored or overlooked, as do their causes. Grief and sorrow or violence and trauma, abuse and loss, anger and resentment, shame and guilt. And we are all exposed. We are all of us exposed to these. We witness these. We hear these and we see these. These causes are all around us all the time. And they hurt us in our hearts and in our minds, in our very souls and spirits. These are wounds that are invisible to the naked eye, wounds that are, again, often left untreated. And it doesn't help, right? It doesn't help that in America, we idolize rugged individualism. Think about it. We have a culture that convinces us that we should be able to endure these traumas alone. Our culture tells us that we must be the strong, silent type. Women and men, right? All of us. Our culture tells us that asking for help means we're soft. That kindness is weakness. And yet we know that that is not what Christ wants or who Christ calls us to be 
We are called to be loving and joyful, peaceful and patient, good and gentle, kind and faithful. Those are the fruit of the spirit that we are called to show, to live into and out of. We are called to live in connection with each other, in relationship, in community, just as we know and we are loved by a God who exists in community, right? Father, Son, Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, sustaining in community. Pew Research tells us right now we are experiencing three distinct, three distinct crises concurrently. Right now in America, we have a youth mental health epidemic. Studies show that 40% of high schoolers, 40% experience persisting feelings of sadness or hopelessness. One in every five young people ages 10 to 24, one in five have seriously considered attempting suicide. Our country is also experiencing a serious mental illness crisis, both diagnosed and undiagnosed schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, post-traumatic stress, anxiety and depression, and the treatment of all of these affect all of us, whether we realize it or not. And then there is America's ongoing addiction crisis and substance use abuse. It's fueled by abuse of drugs and alcohol, specifically overprescribed opioids, oxycotton and fentanyl, drugs that are available both legally and illegally. Each and every one of these, all of these combined, left untreated, affect us all, infect us all, and our whole culture our communities, our individual families, and each and every one of us. It affects our mental and emotional health as well. So what does scripture say? What's the Bible say? Now, mental and emotional health conditions and illnesses and traumas are nothing new. While there is no specific terminology in the Bible, scripture is chock full of people who have experienced these as well. Consider Hagar, right? She's cast out of her tribe with her infant son to survive on their own in the desert. Or Joseph, right? Joseph, who's sold into slavery in a foreign land by his brothers. Naomi, Naomi, whose husband and sons die, and she becomes a refugee. Or Paul. You ever consider Paul? Paul has been shipwrecked three times, beaten five times, and imprisoned three times. Even Jesus. You ever think about that? Even Jesus, praying in the garden before his arrest and his torture and his crucifixion. There are plenty of stories and characters in scripture which provide for us a window, a mirror even, into what it is to experience mental and emotional traumas and hurts and illnesses and pain. Perhaps in all of scripture, the greatest of these is in Psalm 88. Hear these words. God, you're my last chance of the day. I spend the night on my knees before you. I've had my fill of trouble. I'm camped on the edge of hell. I am written off as a lost cause. One more statistic, a hopeless case, abandoned as already dead, one more body in a stack of corpses. And you, God, have dropped me into a bottomless pit. You sunk me in a black pitch abyss. I'm battered senseless by your rage, God. You turned my friends against me, made me horrible to them. I'm caught in a maze and I can't find my way out. I'm blinded by tears of pain and frustration. I'm at my prayers every morning. I'm on my knees each day. Why, God, do you turn a deaf ear to me? Why do you make yourself scarce? For as long as I remember, I've been hurting. I've taken the worst that you can hand out. I've had it. Your wildfire anger has blazed through my life. You have made lover and neighbor alike dump me, and the only friend I have left is darkness. An embarrassment to conventional faith. An embarrassment to conventional faith. That's what 
some theologians have called the 88th Psalm. It's one of the darkest in all the corners of scripture. And here we find this writer, this psalmist, in total despair, utter agony, completely abandoned by everyone. It seems even God. By description and by definition, this is one person's very real and very personal experience with depression. Depression, one of the most commonly diagnosed mental health issues today. Nearly one in 10 people in America will experience depression each and every year. And only one in three seek care. In Psalm 88, it seems, it might seem like there's nothing but darkness here. It might seem as if God is nowhere to be found. And yet, and yet Psalm 88 reminds us of just how our faith and our mental and emotional health align. Because the opposite of depression The opposite of depression is not joy or happiness. The opposite of depression is not gratitude or pleasure. The opposite of depression is not peace or patience or hope or even love. Dr. Edith Egger reminds us of this. The opposite of depression is expression. Because what comes out of our bodies doesn't make us ill. What stays in our bodies does. Dr. Edie, as she is known, was born in Hungary in 1927 and was just 16 when she and her family were sent to Auschwitz, where her parents were murdered in a gas chamber their first day there. She and her sister barely survived. They were liberated in 1945. And after immigrating to America and studying psychology, Dr. Edie, who is now 96 years old, has made it her life's work to seek her own healing and mental and emotional freedom. And she has made it her career, her calling to help others do the same. As a psychologist, as a mental health care worker, and as an advocate and author. So how, how do our faith and our mental and emotional health work together? If the opposite of depression is expression, then... Think about this. Then your creativity and your imagination, your inspiration, your your artistry matters. And think about this. We worship a God who is by description and definition, first and foremost, creator. We heard about that last week from Pastor Evie. God created. And God created you in the image of God to be a creator as well, to be creative. Psalm 33 tells us that God spoke and all of creation came into existence. God spoke, God speaks still, and so too can you. So too can each and every one of us. And I think that is the good news of Psalm 88. That is exactly what the The psalmist, the writer of Psalm 88 does, is they speak. They express themselves with perhaps some of the boldest and the realest words in all of Scripture. Our faith and our mental and emotional health go hand in hand. When we realize that God never wants us to be harmed or to be ill or to be sick or injured... And we know this because the gospel shows Jesus over and over and over again as healer. That God seeks our health and our healing and our wholeness. So when we are unwell, when we are sick or ill, when we are struggling down, anxious, depressed, God is still present, will always be present, even even when God is silent. And how do I know this? Because God is present in our words and in our cries. God is present in our tears and in our screams even. God is present in in our very brokenness. Because, Because Christ too was broken. Christ too was broken. But as Easter shows us, Just a few weeks ago, as Easter shows us, brokenness is not the end of Christ's story. And it is not the end of your story either. It's 
not the story. It's not how the story ends. So 21 years ago, when I returned home from the war in Iraq, someone asked me essentially the same question that we Methodists have been asking, right? What's the question? How goes your soul? Another way to really ask it is, how are you doing? How are you really doing? I discovered that when someone asks this question and actually gives space and place to allow us to share, to truly speak, and when they truly listen, when they really listen, our lives are changed. My life was changed. It's transformed. Because every story needs a listener. Every story needs a listener. And each and every one of us have stories. Every one of us can also listen. There is a reason that so much of our healing happens in counseling or therapy when we simply speak. When we create and express ourselves through our words. When someone used to share their mental or emotional struggles with me, and again, people come to us as pastors and they say, I, got, I need to talk. And I used to think to myself, I used to catch myself thinking, what do I say? What, what should I say? Now, after years of learning, instead I think to myself, how can I listen? How can I listen? And you've heard me say that hurt people hurt people, and, and I, I do, I believe that's true, but I also believe that not all hurt people hurt people because some people have been hurt, some people have been hurt and they've sought healing. They can't imagine, they can't imagine hurting somebody else the way that they have been hurt. And so they invite us to heal. They invite others to experience the healing journey that they're on. This is another way that our faith and our mental and emotional health connect. That we, each and every one of us, we are invited to be about the healing of the world. We're invited to be Christ in people's lives. It starts with our own healing. And then those around us, family and friends, and, and then it expands to even more people, to strangers even. Because healing can happen when we express ourselves in healthy ways, when healthy expression is what it means to, to show and to share what we're feeling and thinking and how we're living. Expression tells the story of who we are, of whose we are. It tells a story of courage. It takes courage. That's what it looks like I hope for you here at Platwoods Church, a place that you belong, where you can feel like you are first and foremost loved and beloved. Faith and mental and emotional health can look like a lot of things. In, in my own house, in my family, it looks like daily prayer and monthly therapy and weekly worship and daily medication and regular family reflection time and quarterly psych evaluations. Mental and emotional health care can look like a lot of things. And knowing our faith can complement our mental and emotional well-being, that Christ wants us to be healthy and healing and whole. It's what it's about. Because Christ came into our lives, came into the world that we can have abundant life. It's, it's what we invite people into here at Platwoods Church, into full life. So today I want to ask the question, and I want to throw it up on the screen. This is the question that we want to ask, that we want to invite you to consider is, what is it like to be mentally and emotionally healthy for you? What's it like to experience full life? Full life. This is what Christ wants for you, for each and every one of us, together in community, in relationship. That's what we want for you here as well at Platwoods Church. May it be so. Amen.